This is not the tree of the tree. Matthew chapter 6. This is uh, Daniel's last Sunday here for two months. He's going to go to Columbia. And he's going to get to see his dad for the first time in, what, nine years, Daniel? It's been nine years since you were nine years old. And his father's unsaved, so pray for him as he goes. He's been burdened about being able to share the gospel with his father. And I know his dad's going to get saved. This is going to be a wonderful thing. Pray the Lord will use him in his testimony. Make that a very precious, special time for them. We'll miss you. So make sure to let him know. If you will pray for him while he's gone, make sure to let him know that you're praying for him. It's a great opportunity. And one of those things that, boy, it's a great burden. You know, my dad got saved about uh, three years before I was born. And our entire family is different because of my dad being saved. Most of my family on my dad's side are all born-again believers. And I was raised in a Christian home as a result of that. And so it's a wonderful thing when God saves somebody in the family and then he begins using that person in the family to preach the gospel. And it's so exciting to see what God is doing. Don't forget about that, folks. I've heard some pessimistic Christians that try to think, try to say that, that uh, God's not doing great things, and He is. He just is. It's a real lack of faith that uh, limits us, I believe, from seeing God do anything. And so we look forward to that. Good to see you on last Sunday, Daniel. We will miss you while you're gone. You found Matthew 6? I look back one verse to chapter 5 and verse 48, and we'll read that, and then we'll read down to verse uh, verse 4, although we'll perhaps, if we have time, get further along in our text this morning. Verse 48 of Matthew 5, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And then verse 1 of chapter 6, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them, Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee What's that last word? Openly. Openly. Yeah. Let's pray. Let's ask God for the ability to wrap our minds around that truth today and to implement it into our thinking. God, without you we can do nothing. Lord, this morning we do not need a sermon of cleverly assembled words to move us. We realize that that could affect us and that could affect our thinking and even get action from us. But what we really need, God, is for Your Spirit to move us and to make the way that You think to affect our thinking forever. And I just pray that that would be the result of what's done here today. God, if there be a person here today that does not know You, I pray that the message would not confuse individuals about perfection and help them uh, not to thank God. We ask that any person could be perfect we just pray that you would help us to comprehend the Scripture and to apply it. Make choices about discipleship today. We pray in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Well, some weeks ago, we started our study in Matthew. And if you haven't been here for the entirety of it, you may have missed a little bit of the introductory information that really is key to understanding the Scripture. It's a tragedy, but it's really true that Bible scholars misapply the Gospel of Matthew more than any other probably text in the Scripture. Now that's my statistic. I don't know what the most misapplied Scripture in the world is, but I will tell you that a lot of confusing doctrine comes from a misapplication of Matthew chapter 5 and 6. A lot of people really distort and twist, particularly the Gospel, or what's required in order to be born again by a misunderstanding and a misapplication of Matthew 5 and 6. And perhaps there is not a passage of Scripture where Christians innocently embrace elements or aspects of doctrine which confuse and undermine uh, their eternal security. Perhaps it's one of the most common passages to be misapplied, misapplied and for Christians to be affected by it, actually. 
And so I want to just explain a little bit about it. The portion of the scripture we are in, of course, is uh, often called what? It's called the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. And while it is a sermon, that is, it is a delivery as a sermon, uh, it is not a gospel message. And that is one of the areas where people are actually greatly confused. I tell people all the time uh, that this is not the greatest gospel message in the Scripture by any stretch of the imagination. I am close. I think my opinion about this is that the greatest gospel message that was preached ever was probably the one preached by one of the least capable men in his own strength, and that would be Peter on the day of Pentecost. You talk about a powerful gospel message. Peter preached the whole Old Testament in a few minutes. And he, his conclusion was, uh, this same Jesus whom ye crucified, that God hath made him both Lord and Christ. I mean, he preached an in-your-face message to people who were a few days previous responsible for killing Jesus. You talk about a powerful message. It's going to take a powerful message to preach to people who want to kill Je who killed Jesus and who want to kill you for following Jesus and to have the courage to show them from the Scriptures that Jesus is Christ and then conclude by saying you killed Him and God's made Him Lord in Christ. And the Bible says the result of that message was when they heard this, they were pricked to the heart and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? In other words, not only did they preached the Gospel message, but God convicted them and they were literally broken hearted over it. And they said, what do we do? And Peter explained, he preached uh, Joel and he talked about how the promise is unto you and unto your children and us, unto them that are far off. And he said, repent and be baptized in the name of the Holy Ghost for remission of sins. And guess what the people did? That day there were 4,000 men saved and they literally publicly in front of the people who had crucified Jesus got baptized, identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and openly declared, made their declaration, that I too am a follower of Jesus. My friend, that was a powerful message. For me, my personal opinion, that's it when it comes to great messages in the Scripture. You say, you'd say that's a more powerful gospel message than what Jesus preached? Yeah, I would, actually. Uh, because it was the Holy Spirit of God that spake, spoke those words and that moved in the midst of of those things. And that, my friend, is the illustration of Jesus' promise when He told His disciples after the Holy Ghost had come upon them, uh, that He said, it's expedient for you that I go away. Uh, that is literally the culmination of the promise that Jesus made, that greater things than these, the things that He'd done, shall you do because I go unto my Father. Did anyone preach a greater message or sermon than Jesus? Yeah. Actually, Jesus said it was so, and it is. God, God's Son is not a liar, my friend. Okay, now I want to qualify a couple of things. We were introduced by Matthew. We saw the type of people that God uses in chapter 1. We looked at the genealogies. We looked at the people in the genealogy. That is, the, this person begat this person. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brother, and Judas begat Pharaoh, and Pharaoh begat Zerah of Tamar, and, uh, uh, and so on. The Scripture goes on and on and on. We look at all the different individuals that are part of that genealogy, and we see people that should not belong in the lineage of a king. We see a person uh, begat by Tamar. Man, I'll tell you something, Tamar, boy, that was a shady deal between her and her father-in-law, mm -hmm. getting the heirs of the promise, but God uses shady people. Right. Rahab, God used Rahab, and God uses people with a questionable history. God changes people. Uh, Ruth, a Moabitess, a woman uh, who is a descendant of Esau who profaned his birthright, didn't want anything to do with Jesus, and yet Ruth did, and God used her, and, and the list goes on. Then you look at Solomon, and the, the description is of her that had been the wife of Urias. Yeah, Solomon uh, uh, was, his, his mother committed adultery with David, and David killed his mom's husband. That's a little bit shady. And we come down, we see that the last person in this lineage is a person who actually isn't Jesus' earthly father. God is Jesus' father. Uh, but we see Joseph, a man who was a just man, not willing to make Mary a public example and wanted to put her away privately. And we see this man Joseph being in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And all that to show what? All that to show the kind of people that God uses. And I want to tell you something. I can insert myself right in that bunch and fit just fine. Friend, you and I ought to be encouraged that we have a God who does not save amazing 
people, but God saves sinners and does incredible things Amen. with them. God can do amazing things with you as well. So we saw the progression. We saw some of the prophecies, the birth of Christ. And now we're in a place where Jesus has called his disciples, and we made a distinction between being saved, being born again, and being a disciple. Well, the question that we asked, and you can answer this again this morning, was, is <clears throat> salvation a requirement for discipleship? It's a trick question, so answer it carefully. Is salvation a requirement uh, for discipleship? No. Yes and no. <laughs> yes, not really a good answer. Okay, so who would illustrate Judas. the... Yeah, Judas. I mean, Judas is a disciple. Was he saved? Was he born no. again? No. And so, friend, I just want to help us with something. This is not the gospel according to Jesus in Matthew 5 and 6, in spite of what uh, individuals like John MacArthur and so forth would teach. This is the orientation of a disciple that Jesus is teaching in Matthew 5 and 6. Discipleship and salvation are different topics. They're different matters entirely. And we have a lot of Christian statements and buzzwords which make the two the same. There are a lot of things that Christians say. You ever heard this one? If Jesus isn't Lord of all, He isn't... Lord at all. Is that true? Yes. <laughs> Tony, shut up, Tony. We're going to have a stone. Okay. <laughs> Hold my hands on me. <laughs> uh, no, the, the fact of the matter is it's a clever statement, but actually there's, there's not an ounce of truth in it anywhere in the Scripture at all. What makes Jesus Lord? Well, God hath made Him both Lord and Christ, the Bible says. So God's got that lordship of Jesus thing handled pretty well. Mm -hmm. Now, does the Bible teach biblical lordship for a believer? Sure. Yes, it does. It isn't a trick question. Jesus Christ ought to be ought to be on the throne in our lives, and uh, He is whether you acknowledge Him or not. By the way, but lordship or discipleship does not make you saved, my friend. That is a matter of practicing mm -hmm. something that you're supposed mm -hmm. to. And we as Christians ought to understand the difference between being a disciple or a follower or a learner of the Lord Jesus Christ, and an individual who is born again. A Christian, I want to tell you something, a lot of, uh, a lot of believers really struggle in this area. I've seen, I remember being in high school and going to camp and having my friends get saved every single summer. And I mean, they, they surrendered all the things that the preacher preached against, whether it was music, whether it was friends, whether it was relationships, whatever. And they got right about it at camp and got saved. And then they came home, and we had you know the burning. We uh, you know burn or shoot all the CDs and DVDs, and get all the trash out of their lives. And a few months later, they buy them all again, and they get saved the next summer. And we did that same thing. Is the reason was because they were confused, or the preachers were confused mm -hmm. about the difference between discipleship and the gospel, because there wasn't a clear distinction made between being saved, something God is responsible for, something that's an internal matter. Uh, something that is a require, requires only simple faith and faith being illustrated by Jesus himself as being looking in the same way that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. In other words, for the people to be healed in the wilderness, all they had to do after they were bitten by a venomous serpent was to look at it and God saved them. And Jesus said, the same way that Moses lifted up the serpent, I've got to be lifted up, and whoever believes in me is not going to perish but have eternal life. And that's the gospel. And by the way, friend, nobody knows the gospel better than Jesus does, so don't try and add to it. I'm so tired of preaching the gospel from John 3 and people uh, deriding Jesus description or Jesus' explanation of what the gospel is and telling me, well, yes, of course, believing in faith, that's important, but there's also and yada, 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 all the things that people add to the gospel. Read the average gospel tract and see the prayer at the end of the gospel tract and the things that are required uh, for a person to be saved, my friend. It's a good thing Jesus didn't know about that, isn't it? No, the fact of the matter is Jesus knows what the gospel is. And it is, look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. That's Jesus' gospel. And I'll tell you, anything but that is short of what a man could do now, we did see in our text this morning, bringing ourselves kind of segueing into uh, our text this morning, as we, uh, if you will, we saw in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, or the Beatitudes, literally the orientation or the rules or requirements about, about uh, the, what is required for disciples, or in order to be disciples. The first thing we saw is that disciples think differently than we do uh, before we're disciples. 
In other words, Jesus talked about the way that a disciple thinks. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. He said, blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are they do its due hunger and thirst after righteousness. And explained why those things are true. And as we examine what Jesus said about those things being blessings, on the surface we'd say, no, not a blessing. No, no blessing in being poor. Uh, no blessing in mourning. No blessing in, we could talk about, there's no blessing in these things. And yet when we examine them the way that Jesus looks at them from the perspective of a disciple, we have to say, absolutely, those things are blessings. Can't preach that again. It's out there somewhere in YouTube land or something like that, so you can go there and find it and uh, listen to that message. But it, it helps us to understand that Jesus is talking to his disciples about the way that they're supposed to think. And Christian, you and I are supposed to be disciples, are we not? And so you and I need to think differently than the world thinks. If you'll get your thinking straightened out, you'll be an effective disciple. But if you don't get your thinking straightened out, you'll just be frustrated, you'll be confused about spiritual things. Last week we saw that Jesus said to his disciples, he said, I am not come to just think not. He said, think not. So don't think that I'm come to destroy the law. I'm not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And so we then went to Galatians and we looked at what the law's purpose is for a person. The law, the Bible says in Galatians, is a schoolmaster to show us our need for Jesus Christ. And Jesus didn't want anyone to think that the law was no good. There are all kinds of people who redefine or reinterpret the definition of Christian liberty to say that the law is ineffective or it's not good or it isn't holy or it doesn't have a purpose and that Jesus abolished the law and destroyed it to the extent that it has no more jurisdiction. And yet, Jesus tells His disciples, people say to you, if you're to read the rest of Matthew chapter 5, you know, the law says... Thou shalt not commit adultery. I say unto you that a man that looks on a woman to lust after, after her hath committed adultery already. Yeah, the, the, the law says, the law says, but I say. And he, in, he interestingly enough, emphasized to them, to his disciples, that I have a greater standard than the law. I'm fulfilling the law and I'm bringing a higher standard. And I will say to you, Christian, that as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, we do not uh, apply ourselves to the law standard. We apply ourselves to the higher standard uh, than the law. And we need to get that thing straightened out in our lives. You say, Pastor, nobody can do that. No, and the last command in Matthew chapter 5 is, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now let me ask you a question. Let's, let's engage our brains once again because we're about to preach here in a moment, okay? Let me ask you a question. Is it possible for you to be perfect like God in heaven is? Trick question. <laughs> I love trick questions. Right? I had a pastor friend of mine, Dr. Shermerhorn, uh, when he preaches. I would tell you something, I don't think I've ever gotten the right answer when he's asked the question. You know, I could give him reason, biblical reason for what I've answered, but there's always an answer he's looking for that's not the answer. You know, the question is, could you be perfect as, as your Father in Heaven is perfect? And the obvious answer to it, doctrinally and actually, we could, we can, because Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. That's the only way any person can be perfect as our Father in Heaven is perfect. Do you get that? Do you think that Jesus said that by mistake? Do you think that He gave this higher standard for discipleship and told His disciples, now you have to be perfect? Just like God. And do you think that the disciples are sitting there thinking, that's tough. <laughs> that's a little much. My friend, if that's the Gospel... There's not a person in the world who's going to heaven, ever. If that's the gospel. That isn't the gospel, is it? But Jesus wants us to know the means for perfection. If you're here this morning, let me just tell you what it is. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, so we know no one's perfect like God in heaven is. Matter of fact, we are all short of the perfection of God. We're short of access to God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Just like I mentioned a moment ago, Jesus told, uh, he told Nicodemus, a man who was very religious, who was very knowledgeable about the law, he told him, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And he was speaking of his cross, the fact that he was going to shed his blood on the cross for the sins of the world. 
And John 3.16 is one of the most precious verses in the Scripture. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. My friend, how can you be perfect? You can not be perfect in your own works, but you can be covered by the perfect blood of Jesus Christ. And you can receive Jesus by looking to Him and praying to be saved. Look unto me, ye ends of the earth, and be saved. My friend, that's how you can be perfect. I am continually amazed when I ponder the truth that when God looks at me knowing what I am and what I've done, He also looks at me seeing the innocent blood of Jesus covering my sin, and He looks at the blood and says, Perfect. Perfect. That's perfect blood that Jesus offered. How can you and I be perfect? By being under the blood of Jesus Christ. My friend, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you're here this morning and you've never heard that message before, you may have some questions, but they are questions which can easily be answered and understood. And you can leave today actually qualifying the way that Jesus said. Now we move on in chapter 6. And so we, Jesus taught His disciples in chapter 5 of Matthew how to think and now he's going to teach them not only how to think, but how to act. And this is an area we need a little bit of education as believers. Matter of fact, uh, not to get off on a rant or anything like that, but it's rather popular sometimes to do things as believers differently than what Jesus details or lays out in Matthew chapter 6. Now, in verse 1 of chapter 6, Jesus said, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Uh, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Now friend, God's Word here says what it means and means what it says. We know that there are other places in Scripture that allude to the same truth that if men look to you and think you've done a mighty great deed, then God in heaven says, well, that's what you were looking for, is for men to be impressed by you, and so you had what you were looking for. Now there's some pretty serious application in this passage of Scripture, if we'll be honest about it. You know, it's amazing to me what people will do, knowing that God's Spirit lives in them as a believer. Places that they'll take the perfect Holy Spirit of God, and yet they wouldn't take me to those same places, or they wouldn't do those things in my presence. That's actually pretty true of human nature, isn't it? There are things perhaps, I do not know this, but God and you know it, there are things perhaps last week that you thought or said or did that you'd be humiliated if pastor knew or if anyone else here knew, but you are just fine with God's Spirit knowing about it and you're not terribly bothered about it because you are more concerned about what people think than what God thinks. And giving is an easy way to illustrate this. Do you, have you ever noticed in our church we don't talk a lot about giving or dollar amounts? Did you know in our church that Pastor Price doesn't know what you give? Now, I've had many, many pastors counsel me and say, Pastor, your giving in your church would be better if you were more aware of who's giving what. You'd know who isn't giving. And if you knew who wasn't giving, people would know you know who isn't giving. And if they knew you knew, they'd give more. And my, my uh, thought about that is, if they don't give for God's sake, I don't want them to give for my sake. I'm just as soon, I tell people all the time, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, it says about our giving, it says specifically that if we give, the Bible says it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. And I've realized years ago that a person who has a penny and gives it because God laid it on his heart, God accepts it in proportion to what he has. Don't you love the illustration when Jesus, when they are standing by the treasury and everybody's giving and the widow comes in and throws in a mite? literally almost nothing, and Jesus said she just outgave everybody because she gave everything that she had. And so God's not impressed with the quantity of what He's entrusted you to give. In other words, anything you have, and I hate to break it to you, but anything that you have, God allows you to have. Right. You're not so clever or intelligent or yeah. better than anyone else that you have something because of your ability, your strength, or whatever. You say, Pastor, no, I earned this. No, God gave you the ability to earn it, but God gave it to you. It's His. It belongs to Him. And so do you if you're His child. And so nothing anybody gives impresses God. 
You could give too much. You could literally, when you're called upon to give or the Spirit of God lays on you to give, you could literally give more than God wants and the reason you'll normally do that is because you're giving to be seen of men. Isn't it amazing when giving is public? You know, you know, you have these uh, share thons and these challenges. You have a matching gift. Well, I'm going to give $5,000 and somebody else says, ooh, look at him. You know, they kind of Ananias and Sapphira the whole thing. At least they want people to see what they give. And boy, you want to get giving to, you know, you want to go for numbers. One of the best things you can do is tell what people give. But my friends, Jesus said, take heed. The Lord said, watch out, be careful. Literally, this is not just a suggestion. I suggest that you give uh, to impress God instead of impressing man. It's not a suggestion, it's a warning. It's a warning. And as such, you and I ought to seriously heed the warning. We ought to say, okay, Jesus is telling disciples all the things that He can tell disciples. Now let me ask you a practical question. What in the world do disciples of Jesus have to give anyway? Jesus said the foxes have their holes, the birds have their nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay His head. What's a disciple have to give if he's dependent on hanging out with Jesus? Think of it this way. Do you remember when they came into, was it Capernaum? I, I, I may be wrong about the town. But a man asked, I believe it was Peter and James, does your master pay taxes? And, and they said, uh, yeah. And they went and asked Jesus, hey, somebody asked me to pay taxes. And Jesus said, well, let me ask you a question. <laughs> As God, am I obligated to pay taxes to man? And the answer is no. But Jesus said, lest we should offend them, take a, take a, a, a hook and cast it, catch a fish, go to the sea, catch a fish, and take the coin that's in the mouth and pay your taxes and my taxes. That's really the way giving is done with the Lord Jesus. In other words, it isn't, well, you know, I've got to be a millionaire, I've got to have a lot to give in order to give. No, what you have to have is God to provide for you to give. Right. Mm -hmm. that's, that's it, pretty simply. Amen. But the fact of the matter is that the Scripture boldly declares or boldly makes a warning, take heed that you do not your own before men to be seen of them. Some years ago, and you folks will probably be angry at me when you know this, some years ago a wealthy man offered to buy us a building for our church. And it was when we were meeting in a storefront on Federal Highway. And he, he gave us a budget. He said, we'll go find a building for like, I think it was $1.1 million or something like that, which won't buy much around here. But uh, it was a lot more money than, you know, than we have or had or will have or... Uh, whatever. It was a lot of money. But there were some stipulations along with it. He said, I'm going to pick the building and I'm going to pick the location. And I said, well, you know, we do need to talk to our church about this. And he said, they're not buying it. I am. And uh, the idea would be that he would buy a building we'd put his name on it. And you know what we decided? You didn't decide, but pastor decided, you know, that we don't really need that. We don't need a man to buy us a building. We need God to give us one. Amen. 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 Right. Amen. And you know something? God can do whatever He wants. He can give whatever He wants. But if a man does it, you'll never know what God will do. That's right. Wow. That's good. It's tragic, my friend, to put two pennies in the offering plate when God wants you to put one because you have just been a bad steward of what God's given you. If everything you have belongs to God, and if you are responsible to God for stewardship, to use it precisely the way that He tells you to give, and you give more because you want to impress a man, my friend, you have just been a bad steward. You don't have the right to give to be seen of men. And that's the point. You do not have the right to give to be seen of men. You, Pastor, what if somebody knows what I've given? Let me ask you this. You think anybody's ever come and said, Pastor, you know, I'd like to give to something. I'd like to give toward this. What do you think would be a good amount? What's needed? Well, a lot of times this morning, didn't I say, hey, you know what? We want to do something, this project, uh, buying $2 bills, and we want to invite people to come. You know, when somebody could ask, come and say, well, Pastor, how much, how many, uh, how much money is, is, has been given so far for $2 bills? I'd like to make up the amount of the difference of that. And Pastor, know what you give. But you know there's a difference between be giving to be seen of men and to give to be seen of God. See, that's the idea. It isn't a technicality. It'd be fun, wouldn't it, if on Sunday mornings we'd you know, crawl under the pew and write a check, crawl under a chair, write our check. 
smuggle it into the offering plate, you know. <laughs> and never, you know, we took it to the... That isn't the point, is it? That isn't the spirit of what's being said at all. The spirit of what's being said is be concerned about what God thinks. Don't be concerned about what man thinks. And if you do, that's it. You'll have your reward. And let me add one last thought to that, if you're taking notes or if you're thinking of it. If you have that reward, my friend, you're missing the one God wants you to have. So you can have that reward. You can get it. But the problem is, is if God gave you something to do something with, there's a reward that God has for you, and you missed the reward God had for you. Watch out. Look out. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? Now let me ask you a question. Is this a matter that is salvific? Could you lose your salvation or could you earn your salvation? Lose your salvation for doing it wrong or earn your salvation for doing it right? It has nothing to do with it. It has to do with being a good disciple. And the practical question this morning is what kind of a disciple are you? Let's move forward. In verse 3, Jesus gives the standard of the how. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. Let me just share a testimony. I'm going to tell you about all the things I've ever given in all my life so that you can be encouraged and I can have my reward this morning. No, not really. <laughs> but the thing I would like to do this morning is just share it with you the testimony or testify that what God's Word says is true. I have found, I'll tell you the percentage of times, I have found for a percentage of time, or a certain percentage of things that the Scripture teaches, I've actually found that, that it applies and it's true in my life. And the percentage of time that I've found that is 100%. Many, many times throughout my life, I've looked at the Word of God and I've said, huh, I didn't know that. And I've adjusted my thinking to what the Word of God says and I've exercised faith in practicing the thing and consequently, I have realized that God was right and that what He says works. And the amount of times that that has happened for me personally is 100% of the time. I don't know how I compare with other people as, as regards giving, but I know this. I know that I've always been able to give whatever God lays on my heart. And I know this, God has always given me what He lays on my heart to give. And I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, something else related to that. I don't know what I've given. can't remember. Now you say, Pastor, I believe that because your memory is becoming so terrible. Uh, and that's actually true. I'm losing my mind. I'm on borderline dementia. Probably the you know, next time you see me, I'll just be, I won't know who you are or who I am. Who knows? It's going. It's happening. But the reality of it is that is not why. The reason why is because I've tried to practice giving the Scripture away. In other words, don't let your left hand know what your right hand giveth. You'll, you'll chuckle at this. When my wife and I were first married, both of us loved to give. And when we were first married, <laughs> she had a checkbook and I had a checkbook. And we both gave on our income and then calculated, not yet, buddy. Hey, Jeff, come in and sit down until the service is over. Be a minute. Ah. Oh, well, he's just hold on. Okay. All right. He wants to play basketball. And by the way, let me just, this is unrelated, but let me just issue you a warning. Uh, the kids in the neighborhood that come to play basketball, it's hard for them to rebound when you park your car under the hoop, but that will not stop them from shooting. So just, just to let you know, where's our car? <laughs> and so uh, we don't let them shoot during church service, but you you're, you're, you're consider yourselves warned, okay? I don't know who's liable if your windshield or your hood or whatever is smashed. Yeah, I may be liable for it, but I'm just telling you the facts as they stand. And these kids uh, will shoot the ball even if they... They would rather be able to rebound it, but if they can't, that won't stop them from shooting. I thought parking the bus like all the way up under it would stop kids. No, it just bounces off the bus. And, that's so, and if you were ever a kid and you can remember how it is, that's how it is. So just so everybody knows you've been, you've been educated. A little bit. Now, back to what we're talking about. In my life, personally, I will testify to you. I was talking about how my wife and I, uh, both of us had checkbooks when we were first married. 
and we found out, uh, I think when she was trying to balance the checkbook, something that, that's not really necessary you know, if you just know what's in it. But mm -hmm. for some reason she thinks it's necessary. She's trying to balance the check, but we found out we both were tithing and giving, and we both were tithing and giving, not just on our income, but on each other's income. Oh. You know, and just like, yeah, we were getting it done very, very well. And literally the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing in our marriage. It was a good uh, illustration of one flesh. Uh, and I'll tell you something. What we did was uh, we got rid of my checkbook. We gave her the checkbook. Uh, so that she could give as she wants to, and when I want to give something, in addition to that, I just get a check or whatever, or give however, sometimes I have cash or whatever, really. Uh, but one of the things that we did take from that in our marriage that's been a real blessing to us is that if my wife wants to give, she can. And if I want to give, I can, because we're one flesh, and the right hand isn't supposed to know what the left hand is doing. And if you'll adopt that in your family, you'll be amazed how God will bless it. He'll, just, he'll take the same thing, the same uh, principle or attitude that's for an individual, and he'll compound it in a marriage. So I have no idea what we give. She has no idea what we give. We just are both burdened to be givers. And I'll tell you something else that's true about it. The scripture is just absolutely true. I can't remember many, many times. I can't remember giving. Just don't remember it. I know this. I've never given and missed what I gave. Never given and missed what I gave. I don't remember what I gave. But I've always had what I needed. Yep. And the reason is the last thing we see in our text uh, this morning, and that is down in verse 4. The Bible says that thine alms may be in secret. And by the way, I never defined alms. Alms simply is, is giving. Sometimes it's giving specifically to the poor, but alms is just giving, and, it's, and it means money. Giving money, if you want to study. Okay, Verse 4, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward the openly. Other places in the scripture where God's word addresses giving, give an illustration like this. God puts in this hand what he wants you to give with this hand. And when you give with this hand, God puts in this hand what he wants you to give with this hand. And the, literally the way the Bible teaches about giving is given it shall be given unto you. Press down. Remember this? And in good measure, overflowing, shall God heap into your bosom. And that literally is what happens. If you get in order to give, in order to get, yep. in order to give, in order to get, to give, to get, to give, you'll always be giving and you'll always be getting. Mm. And God will just do wonderful things with you. Amen. Amen. It's true. Yep. It's true. And I want to tell you, you misers don't know anything about it. <laughs> you folks that are working extra hours every week so that you can make ends meet because you don't have enough and you don't have enough because you don't think God can bless you and you can't be faithful in matters and, you, and one of your excuses is you know pastor I just have to do this because I've got to have so that I can give but you never give mm. and so you never get mm -hmm. and it's just amazing how that all works out I realized some years ago God doesn't want me to be a millionaire I realized it, and the way I realized it was because I didn't become one. That's the way I realized it. You know? Here's the deal. I found that whenever something happens in my life, and it does all the time, actually, by way of a windfall. You know, I mean, literally, there's just it's just unexpected, and something happens, and you get something. It's amazing that if God gives me something unexpected, and I don't give it to Him, then something breaks, and I give it to that. I, I'm literally always faced with, well, I could give it to the church or I could buy a new AC unit. I could give it to the church or I could have the car towed. I could give to the church or I could whatever, you know, have my wife dental, have my wife's dental work done or whatever. And my wife says, give it. I don't want to have to have dental, dental work. You know, <laughs> this sort of, I'm just telling you, that's the way it works. This is not some kind of mystery that is um, unknown. It's a mystery that's revealed. And I'm just telling you by experience, and anyone who's given will tell you the same thing. Anyone who's a giver will tell you yeah, what God's Word says is true. So this morning we've seen a couple of things about giving, haven't we? If as a disciple you're going to give, first of all, look out. Take heed. Be careful that you don't give so men can see you. Be a secret giver. 
give secretly. Look out, watch out for it. Number two, if you're going to give, give in such a way that your left hand doesn't know what your right hand is giving. And literally just, you say, Pastor, you mean my wife and I can't talk about what to give? No, it's great to pray together about what to give. But I think that really in a marriage relationship, there ought to be some latitude. You want to help your marriage, men, stop telling your wife that she can't spend a dime and teach her to be a giver. I'm serious. Many couples struggle over the whole money issue. They struggle big time with the money issue because one of them doesn't want the other one to give because they want to spend. Just just teach your wife to be a giver. Just, just, just teach your husband to give, be a giver. Just get that thing settled. And I'll tell you something. You won't have to, husbands, you won't have to tell your wife whether she can spend something or not. A giver realizes everything belongs to God and they're very careful with their spending. A giver acknowledges stewardship. And when they acknowledge stewardship, they're careful with their spending. They think, I don't want to buy that. I want to give it to the Lord. My policy with my wife, and I, this is the honest truth, my policy with my wife is if she wants to, she can spend it. She can buy anything she wants. She can charge it on the credit card if she wants to. She can because my wife's a giver. I'm not worried about that. I'm concerned about that. We just want to give. My wife doesn't have quite the same policy for me, but I think that's just husbands for wives. I'm not sure about it. <laughs> joking about that. The reality of a Christian is that God's, God's Word is true. And the last thing, so the first thing, take heed that you do not your alms to be seen of men. And the last thing is, hey, give in such a way that your left hand doesn't know what your right hand gives, and God will give you a reward. God will reward you. The Lord that seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. That's the mystery of it. How does that guy always... How does he do it? How does he do it? Well, he's probably a giver. Probably a giver. You ever see somebody, they make a lot, and they never have enough? And then you see somebody, and you know they don't make much, and they've just always got everything? I'm serious. You know what it is? <laughs> Matthew chapter 6. Amen. Somebody got what God said about discipleship and applied it. I know that's not a gospel message this morning. My friend, the gospel is really in chapter 5 in the last verse. Be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. You're here this morning and you say, well, Pastor, when it comes to being perfect, I'm not even close. Then, my friend, you need what all of us need, the blood of Jesus. And you can have that by simply calling on the name of the Lord. Here this morning, though, you know a lot of Christians struggle with being seen of men. A lot of Christians struggle with this whole matter of being noticed and having men be impressed. And at the same time, they're not one iota concerned with what God thinks. God's spoken to you about that this morning. Why don't you do business with Him? Let's pray. Father, thank You for what You taught us from Your Word today. Lord, it's not profound. It's simple in every aspect. And yet it is so necessary for us to grasp what You've taught us from your word. Lord, if there be a person here this morning that doesn't know Jesus, I ask that that would be made very clear by the convicting of your Holy Spirit. God, if there uh, would be believers here today that have realized truth, and they've even realized, you know something, I, I've been giving, but I haven't been doing it God's way. And I've been warned, and now I need to respond about that. Lord, I pray that you would help them to respond as the Scripture teaches here this morning. Before I finish my prayer, if every person here would keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed, and that would be out of respect for the privacy of every other person here. I'd like to ask a couple of questions this morning that you could answer just by lifting up your hand, and so if you would make sure to uh, make sure that you're not sitting in anyone else's space so that you could have your privacy and they could as well. First question I want to ask this morning would be the question about your eternal security. That is, knowing for sure that you have eternal life and that heaven's your home and it's guaranteed. You're here this morning and you'd say, Pastor Price, pray for me. You know, the giving thing, I realize that that's an important truth, but there's a more important matter this morning that I'm burdened about. With every head bowed, every eye closed, every eye closed this morning, if you'd say, Pastor, I don't know that I'm saved, would you pray for me? Don't call me out, don't embarrass me, but would you pray for me? You just slip your hand up this morning right where you sit at. Okay, I want to ask a second question this morning. Yeah, this morning you'd say, Pastor Price, you know, that matter of discipleship is something that I needed to have clarity about. In many ways in my life, I felt as though my works or what I do 
were connected with or at least evidence for my salvation. And you know the scripture's pretty clear about that. God showed me that today. And with God's help, that's going to be something that I don't struggle with anymore. Uh, Pastor, I just want to commit that to the Lord this morning. We just slip your hand up about that. Just slip it up. Okay. Yeah. Just slip right back down. See those hands. Thank God. Something that you showed me. And I want to be clear about it. Second question this morning would be about the text about giving. Pastor, God showed me some things today about giving that either I was unaware of or I hadn't seen as very important. And with God's help, I'm going to commit those to Him today. And my giving is going to be different from now on as God helps me. If that's you this morning, would you just slip your hand up? Slip it right up. Yeah, that's it. Slip it right back down. See those hands. God, I just ask that you would bless and move in the invitation this morning. So many have been spoken to by the simplicity of your word. And I just pray that you would just meet the needs of the hearts here this morning as we obey your word. God, may we be good disciples of our Lord Jesus. We ask your blessing now in the invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. The invitation in our church is quite simple. It's just the time during the service, if you're not used to a church like this one where we have an invitation, it's a time where we would say, okay, God said this to you. He spoke to you. You know it. Now you speak to Him. You say, yes, Lord. And that would be the invitation this morning. God showed you something. You know it's true. And so now you just need to say, God, whatever it is that you've showed me, I'm going to do it. You could just express what it is that God showed you. You know, in many of our lives, it could be something specific. I'm completely unaware of many of the things that God deals with people about, but you know the specifics of it. And so knowing the specifics of it this morning, would you just say, yes, Lord, uh, during the time of invitation? Brother Taj is standing in the back for two reasons. The first would be that if anyone this morning doesn't know for sure that they're going to heaven, you can just slip right out of your seat during the invitation and go to him and he'll open a Bible and just show you how simply you can know that you have heaven for your eternal home. The second thing would be if you needed some accountability. It might be that this morning you'd say, Pastor, you know what? This is one of those things that I'm afraid to promise God. I think too much sometimes of what men think and I could use that for a good thing. In other words, yeah, I'm going to pray to God and I'm going to tell a man that I told God this just so that I could have that double accountability. That would be just fine this morning if the Lord leads you to do that. You need to pray with somebody. Or you need some counsel about something. That's the invitation. So we're going to take our blue hymn books and open up to page 381 this morning. Our pianist isn't in here yet, so we'll just sing without the piano. As we go to page 381, we're going to ask the question or sing the song, Is Your All on the Altar? If you'll stand to your feet if you're physically able to do so. And while we begin to sing, as soon as we begin to sing, if God spoke it to you, it would be just perfectly appropriate. Instead of singing, to bow your head right where you're at. You may feel the need uh, to move. Maybe come forward and, and uh, kneel on one of these chairs or this bench up front here. Feel free to do that if the Lord's led you to do that. But you do business with the Lord. Maybe just take a seat right where you're at. You don't need to be seen of men about this decision. You need to tell God what God has said and what He's spoken to your heart. So as we sing this morning, you do business. You answer the invitation. You have longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly, fervently prayed. But you can perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the Spirit control? You can only be blessed and have seen praying if God's spoken to you. We're going to sing the last verse of Israel on the altar. If you can't answer that question in the affirmative, my friend, then you could do business with God. Literally, you could come in this place today knowing that you're out of fellowship with the Lord, and you can leave here knowing that you've given it all to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll leave here differently than you came and be better for it. God will do a great work. Let's sing verse 4, and if God's spoken to you and you haven't responded, will you respond as we sing the last verse? Who can tell of the love He has sent from above, and how happy our hearts will be made of 
for being here today. I know you didn't come for my sake, but it's meant a lot to me that you've been here, and I want you to know that. It's meant a lot to the other folks in this church as well. You'd be amazed how it encourages when you're here and how it even discourages when you're not. You think, well, I don't matter that much. My friend, you matter all the world to the Lord Amen. Jesus. He gave His life for you, and you matter to the brothers and sisters as well. So we're glad that you're here. Let me say, as I sometimes do, that I count it a great privilege to be your pastor. I feel as though this is the best church in the world. And I know that everybody ought to feel that way about their church, but I believe it about this one. It's just a privilege to get to pastor such sweet people who are so thrilled about the truth of the Scripture. And I'm just excited on Sunday mornings when I get up and I think about getting together here with you. It's been a great day, and I'm glad that you're here. Please don't forget about the service this evening at 6 p.m. That's the fun service. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you'll have to show up. Also... My messages are normally brief on Sunday nights. Now, normally when I announce that, then for whatever reason, they go longer when people show up to see it. I don't know if it's the antagonist in me or what it is, but uh, normally it's a fast message. But pray for us this afternoon as we go to Miami Beach, as we hold services down there. And if, if you're physically able to do so, please be here this evening uh, for another preaching service. I will close by saying something I've been saying on Wednesdays, but it's perhaps less effective because of the crowd that I say it to. That is this. All week long, the world has influence on you. All week long, you literally are assaulted by everything that Satan can throw at you from the world. And it's really become a really commonplace for believers to only get together uh, in a church service about once a week. It wasn't that way in the early church. Believers met pretty much every night. They got together and they preached, they exhorted, they encouraged each other. And so they at least had a daily influence. In our day, doing well, normally we have about three times that we meet a week. Usually in our church, for instance, it would be Sunday morning, Sunday night, evening, as a Wednesday evening service. Those services are not because we're bored or we can't think of anything better to do with our time. They're actually designed to give you some help, give you a little bit of a start or an injection to help you throughout the week. And if you come to those services, you know that that's true. And uh, I don't know why it is that we would have the expectation that God would have the smallest influence in our lives, but that He would have the greatest results, or that the results of being in church, if we only get about 45 minutes of preaching a week, would affect our entire lives. Here's a sad truth that I run into, and I don't want to lecture anybody. This is the, the tone of what I'm saying this morning at all. But oftentimes I run into parents of teenagers who have exposed their kids to church by bringing them occasionally. And then when their lives are become a wreck, oftentimes those same parents say, I took them to church. As though a random exposure to spiritual things ought to account or make up for being inundated by the world constantly. And my friend, you'll get what you put into it, spiritually speaking. So I'd exhort you, I'd encourage you, prioritize your life so that God gets more and not less. And a way to do that would be to be involved. We have a lot of ways you can be involved in this ministry. We need more workers. We need more folks to grow so that they can encourage and teach others and reproduce ourselves so that we can accomplish God's work. Life's short. It's a vapor. It tears for a while and it vanishes away. And let's live it for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks so much for being here this morning. I want to ask Brother Taj if you'll please dismiss us with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for everything that you've taught us today. For the word to the Lord about giving. I just pray that you would use it and apply it in our lives. Be with us as we dismiss the Lord and help us to be back in time for tonight's service. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.